In 2008, Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden was asked to speak in front of a group of business leaders about the concept of value, and specifically business values. And in that talk, he said to them, you know what, don't show me your value statements. Show me your budget, and I'll show you what you value. I think about that a lot when it comes to creativity in schools and whether or not we design specifically for creativity. Specifically, I think about every school in this country that has a mission statement. Virtually everyone does. And when I see those mission statements and those vision statements and those value statements in those schools, I tend to think the same thing. Don't show me your values. Show me your student schedules, and I'll show you what your school values. When we think about this, I tend to think back to a student I had about 10 years ago who came to me upset about she was in the process of writing an essay for college, and she came to me in the hallway. She was in tears and just destroyed and, and just about ready to collapse because she just couldn't get her essay right. And I thought to myself, no problem. Let's sit down. We'll have an hour. We'll knock this out. I'll work with you. So she says, great. I'll email you. I'll give you some times. About a week later, I don't hear from her. And so I find her in the hallway again, and I'm like, what's going on? She says to me, I can't find a single hour to work on this essay. And I'm thinking, 17-year-old, this is probably hyperbole. Let's take a look at your schedule. She shows me her schedule, and it looks something like this. She's got everything mapped day to day. She's got barely a half an hour a day to do anything that's her own. She's so scheduled that she can't possibly find an hour to work with her teacher on an essay. And I thought to myself, my God, what are we doing to our adolescents that make them not only have schedules that look like this, but also feel the type of pain this kid was feeling? So I started looking into adolescents, specifically the neuroscience of the adolescent brain, and how they deal with things like this. And as I looked into it, I found that when we look at neuroscience, we look at the adolescent brain, that adolescent brains tend to work on about a two-hour time difference from adult brains, meaning that when an adult wakes up at 8 o'clock, if that was an adolescent, it would feel to that adolescent as if they were waking up at 6. So, so I started thinking about this from the adult standpoint, and I was thinking about this in terms of what a job might look like if we had the schedule of our kids. Well, if we had the schedule of our kids, we'd wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Our, our work day would start at 5.30. We'd then go to work, and we'd have seven different bosses telling us what to do every hour. Every one of those bosses would think they're their, their, your, their only boss, and they'd give you work accordingly. So you'd come home, you'd have dinner at five, maybe an hour, an hour and a half, and then after dinner, you'd go back and do all the paperwork you hadn't gotten done that day because you didn't have enough time to do it because your other six bosses told you you had to do something else. And you'd wake up the next morning at four o'clock, and you'd do the whole thing over again. Now, those of us who are adults see that and think about that. Imagine if you did that, not because you loved your job, but because you were hoping that in four years from now, you could get a better job that you could, maybe your resume would be good enough to qualify for. Now, that next job that you're going to get in four years, by the way, the only reason you think it's good is because U.S. News and World Report ranked it really highly. So, this is the type of world in which our adolescents are living. And yet, all of our schools talk about the idea of building creativity. What kind of creativity can happen in a world where you're doing this kind of stuff? If we think about some of the most creative moments in history, Michelangelo, this is the Sistine Chapel. Four years he worked on this. Every day, day and night, he worked on this over four years, lying on his back, painting in this chapel. Could you imagine him at the end of this saying, you know what would have made this a better process? If I had a half an hour a day to work on this in between soccer practice and ACT prep. That's not something that you'd see. So this is why I started thinking about what we need to do to create better schools. I thought, we need to design spaces that are expressly built around creativity. Because right now, our schools are data processing plants. The majority of schools in this country exist as data processing plants. 
the kids show up, we feed them data, they return that data to us, and we move on. But in the last 30 years, what we've found is that human beings aren't really good at data processing. Computers are significantly better at data processing. This is a quick chart to show you that in the next five years, you're going to be able to likely buy a $1,000 computer that is the equivalent of a human brain's speed of data processing. In 30 years from now, you're going to be able to buy a $1,000 computer that's equivalent to the brain power of the entire human race. And yet, our schools still exist as if we are building the best data processors in the world. So in a world like this, what should be the goal of the school? I think the school needs to think about what it is that makes human beings worthwhile on the planet. And I would argue it's two things. I would say human beings exist here for two reasons, one of which is to create relationships and to be emotional supports for one another. And the second is to be creative, to build things from nothing, to take ideas that are disparate and find connections and build things that were not there before that are beautiful and useful. I think that's what makes us who we are, and that's what makes us valuable, and that makes us what we need to be to have a value in the world. So I started looking at creativity and how, how might we design a school that's expressly built around creativity. And I came across this article in the Harvard Business Review. And in the Harvard Business Review, they were actually talking to business leaders about how to create creative solution problem solvers in the business world. And they said, in this process, there's one factor that matters more than anything in building creative problem solvers in your workforce, and that's time. The more time they have, the more likely they are to build a creative solution. However, even if you don't have that much time, you can still build creative problem solvers if those people feel like they, what they're doing is important, has a mission, and they're connected to that purpose. Then you might still, you're not going to get it quite as much as if you give them more time, but you can still get something out of it. In that same article, though, they talked about how do we kill creativity in our businesses. And they highlighted several factors. I'm going to highlight three of them here. One of which is that the people who are working there feel like the work is unimportant. If your workers don't feel like what they're doing is important, they're not going to be creative. Second, if your workers are working on a fragmented schedule, they specifically cite the idea of doing a bunch of things during the day for about an hour at a time and having no connection between any of them, that will kill creativity in your workplace. And lastly, that the workers feel distracted. They don't feel connected to a bigger purpose. And I looked at that, those things, and I thought, that was my high school experience. I can imagine many of you in this audience felt like, I didn't feel like it was important. My schedule was fragmented. I felt distracted. That's pretty much defining most of the high school experiences in America. So I set out to build a high school that tried to confront these challenges and build something that was designed specifically to enhance creativity. So for the last three months, I've been going around the city, the country, talking to people as much as I can about what does it mean to be creative in schools. Ironically, my schedule now looks a lot like that student of mine from the beginning. It's like packed with things, and so I'm, I'm sort of where she's at. I'm falling down and crying a lot. But, <laughs> In doing so, I'm, I realize I need to have my own time to process. And so what I like to do is I like to go for runs. I, I run about an hour a day. And uh, in, that, in those runs, it helps me process things. I'm, I'm thinking about all the conversations I had. A lot of the best, most creative ideas I have are along a run, um, aside from the fact I listen to a lot of podcasts about bad movies and things like that. But when I'm not doing that, I'm thinking about school. And about three weeks ago, when I was out on a run, I was about two blocks from home, and I saw this picture. It, it actually was the storefront. It's right in the corner of, uh, of, of, just on Ashland, just north of my house. And, and at first, I thought, this looks like, it looks like a new running store. It looks like a Nike store. You can tell the font on the window there. It looks like, a, a, like the Nike font. And as I ran closer, I realized it wasn't a Nike store, in fact. It wasn't a, a workout store. It was actually a leisure wear store. Um, and on the window, it said, do less. And as I saw that, I actually stopped. These are my pictures, by the way. You can tell by how good they are. Um, those pictures, I stopped and I said, you know, 
all I'm thinking about here is education, all I'm thinking about is schools, all I'm thinking about creativity. And I saw these two words, do less, and I thought, maybe there's something to be had here. Maybe the key to unlocking creativity in schools comes down to these two words, do less. Right now, we quantify schools by how much they do. Rigor in schools is defined by how many things we force adolescents to do every day. We used to have the three R's. I'd argue now we have the three P's. The first one is prescribed curriculum. AP, IB, all the other silly, ad, silly acronyms we use in education. All these prescribed curriculums. It's the thing I hear most from parents. Do you do AP? Do you do IB? Sometimes I think of a different acronym that has another couple words in it that I'd like to use when it comes to those things, but I don't use it. Um, but that is designed to think, that's designed to equal rigor, prescribed curriculum. The second thing that we like to do is we like to, the next P is planning for college. We spend a huge amount of time in our high schools today talking about something that will happen after they leave. So much so that I was in some schools recently where every room was named after a college. That's like naming every business, every room in your office after retirement communities. <laughs> Why are we focusing in on what happens next? Can we enjoy and appreciate and learn from the moment? Not according to rigorous schools today. And lastly, and most importantly, is pressure. Third P. You take our prescribed curriculum, you plan for college, we're gonna put the pressure on you and you, you send those results. This is where our schools are today. Specifically, we look at the AP US history curriculum. These are all the topics you cover in AP US history. In 100 hours of time, these are all the things you're gonna cover. 100 hours. If you work 40 hours a week, that's two and a half weeks of work. You need to memorize everything on this list, internalize it, and spit it back out for the person in front of the room. And this qualifies as rigorous. You know what kind of person succeeds in a system that requires you to memorize all this stuff in two and a half weeks worth of time and regurgitate it back? Compliant people. People who aren't creative, or who, can, who are creative and can turn that part of their brain off to do exactly what's required on time and on spec and don't add anything new to the mix. Not coincidentally, the type of people who succeed in this system, by the way, also tend to look an awful lot like the teachers in these buildings. Because if you're successful in this system, you often come back to this system to teach in that system and, though it's, and so it self-perpetuates. You know who doesn't work in this system? You know who sucks at it? People who are creative, who can't turn that part of their brain off, who want to ask questions, who want to say, stop, I want to know a little bit more about this, can we talk about it? The answer is typically, now nah, we got something to do tomorrow. The kid who comes into this situation and says, I, I want to know more, and maybe the answer I give you might not be exactly what you want, but it's because I'm thinking about a different question that's built on this. Those are the kids we label as slow, as difficult, as behavior problems. These are the kids who we penalize in systems that are designed around data processing. Our schools today are defined in rigor in terms of how quickly they can put kids on a hamster wheel and make them spin. The faster we can spin on that wheel, the better our schools get ranked. And so as I came into this situation, I thought of another important world leader <laughs> who said very famously, I don't want to stop this wheel. I want to break this wheel. I believe our schools need to refocus themselves. I believe our schools need to think a little bit less about the rigid curriculum and more about the responsiveness to their children. I think we need to build schools today that are not built on rigid curriculum, but instead on responsive systems that listen to every child and decide what is this kid going to be and how can I help them get there? 
We need to think institutionally about the type of systems that create this situation and, and give as much as we can to make them happen. We need to build schools that give students the autonomy and trust to design their learning path, but also have an adult with them to help them marry what they know they need to have in the future with who they are now and find a way to bring it together. A lot of schools talk about autonomy, a lot of schools talk about trust, but look at their systems, look at their schedules. How much trust are they actually giving to children? Adolescents are amazing if we trust them. And we need to build schools who systemically reward their teachers, not for the quickness with which they, they go through that curriculum, but with their ability to listen to, to connect with, to empathize with, to think about the needs of the kids who walk in their door and then design, not based on what AP wants, but what those children need and what they can do for them to make them better people. I think it comes back to this sign. We've gotten so caught up in how much we do in schools. I think we might need to do a little bit less. I think we might need to step back a little bit, take our foot off the gas a little bit, and think about who are these people who are walking into our building, and how do we adjust our system to fit those people. The problems in education are, are, are myriad and systemic. And 18 minutes is not enough to talk about all the problems that exist in education. 1800 minutes is not enough time to talk about all the problems that exist in education. But I think we can start, at the very least, by making a pledge to every child that walks through our door. And I was thinking it goes a little something like this. To every child who walks through this door, we as the adults, entrusted with helping, inspiring, and helping inspire the next generation of creative citizens, promise that we will listen to you more. We will learn about you more. We will empathize with you more. And maybe, just maybe, we'll do a little bit less. I think it's a start. Thank you. <laughs>